Hi, my name is Tim Youngquist, and I'm an Ag Specialist with Iowa State University in the Agronomy Department. I'm the Farmer Liaison for the Prairie Strips Project, and we're actually out here at a Prairie Strip site right now. STRIP stands for Science-Based Trials of Row Crops Integrated with Prairie Strips. So that's exactly what we're looking at. We're out here in the middle of a soybean field at the end of May, and you can see behind me we've got a pretty thick stand of a mix of native wildflowers and grasses. So the idea for Prairie Strip started in the early 2000s um, with the thought being the state of Iowa was once covered with prairie vegetation. So there was a, a mix of these native wildflowers, grasses, sedges, rushes, all, all these different things that were basically from all corners of our state. Um, this made incredible soil for agricultural production. So now most of our state has corn and soybeans being farmed in it. The original theory behind this practice was wondering what would happen if we took some of that initial vegetation and we put it back into these row crop fields. So what we see behind us is just a little bit of this prairie and over nearly 15 years now of, of doing this research we found that taking a small amount of land and putting that cropland back into prairie can really see disproportionate benefits. So by putting prairie in a crop field you can see benefits to uh, reduce soil erosion, reduce nutrient export, increase habitat for a number of different species ranging from bees to butterflies to birds, um, you know, songbirds, things like uh, game birds, pheasants, quail, those, those type of things. Um, all, all across the board you see a, a benefit to wildlife and a reduction in, in soil movement, nutrient movement, um, and essentially you're only taking a, a small amount of land out of production somewhere between five to ten percent of of a watershed or of a field and of that you'll see you'll see a, a number of different benefits integrating prairie into the field um, can be perceived as somewhat of a challenge what i'm trying to do as as someone that is the farmer liaison and helping to lay out these strips is really make the transition from installing the strips just to make that as easy as possible. The first thing that we do if we're going to put infield strips is work with the farmer's equipment to ensure that the the amount of space between the strips is going to be divisible by a certain number of passes either with the planter or with the sprayer or hopefully with both. So let's say you know these strips are 200 feet apart so in between each strip you're going to have uniform passes, you're not going to have any kind of point rows, and it's going to be as, as easy as possible to farm around something that's in the middle of the field. Another big positive to think about with something like installing prairie strips, if let's say you're hesitant about putting something into the field, well, you could consider putting an edge of field buffer on, the, on your field, and the first place that I would encourage you to look at would be the lower edge of the field where the water is leaving the field. If you could buffer that by having um, some, somewhat of a prairie buffer, either a, a linear rectangle or some kind of a half moon, just something in that area of concentrated flow where water is leaving the property, you can see substantial benefits from that as well. Um, one of the exciting things about prairie strips now is that uh, it's actually eligible as a practice for CRP payments. Um, so through the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the Farm Service Agency, there are conservation reserve payment program, or the conservation reserve program allows for payments um, through installing this practice through prairie strips. And, uh, and even another thing that, that kind of makes that more exciting is for the first time you can actually turn around on these prairie strips Typically with a CRP practice, you're not allowed to really drive on it at all. Um, but with these, they would fit really well on the edge of the field or fit really well in an end row situation. Maybe if you have a sharp area along a fence line where it's really steep, rather than farming that up and down the hill, um, install you know an 80 to 120 foot wide buffer on the edge of your field. And then you could simply turn around on that buffer um, and, and save yourself a little bit of time from putting in those end rows and save the water moving up and down through those rows on a steep hill. It's interesting to think we have all this growing vegetation here and you can see on the surrounding cropland 
we've got this incredibly good soil that's that's really vulnerable to wind erosion and rain erosion right now so we have these deep roots we have all this growing material um, and this diversity of plants really supports a, a great variety of both pollinators beetles birds things like that if as we uh if you want to look down here so we've got a good mix of forbs or flowers you can see there's ox eye sunflower right here this is a golden alexander zizia aria um, it's really important for our pollinator species to have flowers throughout the whole growing season so by including a little bit of diversity in the mix having something like golden alexander which is readily available and inexpensive seed um, you can add some early season bloom that really help helps out some of the early season pollinators get going compass plant um, you can see the the thick leaves and what's neat about the perennial vegetation and these natives they they put down these incredibly deep root systems so every year they'll come back larger and larger what started as just one leaf blade coming out of the ground is is now a half a dozen leaves um, here we have canada goldenrod there's a nice bloomer late season um, uh, so here we've got uh, Monarda fistulosa. It's a really nice um, kind of mid-season blooming plant. You can see here, this is a, a little bit more of a mature plant, a little larger, and then next to it, this is probably some seeds that came off of this plant that are growing here. What we found is that the presence of prairie strips in a field does nothing to change the composition of weeds in a crop field. Many of these prairie plants um, are incredibly small seeded. So what we'll find is that any, anywhere where there's tillage disturbance or herbicide disturbance, these plants are gonna have a really tough time establishing out into the crop field. They generally will stay in the strip where they've been planted. Prairie, man, it's just, it's cool. It's like, I can't believe that like something like this, it's like it's native to Iowa. You know, it's like, it looks like it's right out of a desert or something. Uh, so this is what's called Rattlesnake Master. Um, you can see it's got uh, real yucca-like foliage. It's actually in the same family as yucca, which is more of what you think of as a desert plant or uh, something that would grow in a much much drier environment so just um, the biodiversity out here is really really neat canada wild rye you can see the leftovers of the seeds there um, i believe this is more more ox eye sunflower here's another compass plant um, all in all there's there's about 35 different species of, of grasses and, and flowers out here native species and starting here in late may there'll be something blooming until early October. So we'll have a lot of forage and nectar for pollinators. There'll be a lot of good seed. There was a pheasant that just crowed. I don't know if you could hear that on the camera, but um, it's, it's really typical to come out here and you just, you see a lot of life. Covered a relatively small amount of ground in this, in one prairie strip and we've, we've gone about 30 or 40 feet We've seen over a dozen different species. We've got blooming golden Alexander. We've got old seed heads from last year. Um, you know, you can see holes where there's maybe some, some mammals that are doing some digging. From just a pure enjoyment standpoint of it, I've, I've talked to a lot of the farmers that have installed this on their land, and it's one of their favorite spots to go and just, you know, walk around in the evening after supper or you know, going and, and getting flowers, you know, maybe putting a bouquet on the table, something like that for their wife. I mean, there's just a lot of, there's a lot of benefits that come from this beyond just the, the soil and the, the, um, the water retention or the nutrient movement. So there's, there's a lot of benefits that you can get um, by having these out here. And just being able to be out in the prairie, I think um, kind of seeing is believing. So I'd encourage you to go check out some prairie strips in your area as soon as you can. With this mix of plants, you do have to be somewhat cautious around herbicide application. What we have seen is that the strips would be the most sensitive in the first, say, two years during establishment. Most of these prairie plants are gonna have an incredibly deep, incredibly robust root system, and it'll spend the first several years making that, that root system or working on their below ground growth. So the plants can be a little bit sensitive to herbicide drift in that time. Typically what we've seen if, there, if herbicide drift enters into the strips, you may see a plant that starts to curl or turn brown. You may see a plant that doesn't flower in that year, but typically it will come back from those deep roots. And once they're established, they are pretty resistant to herbicide. We're here in a crop field in central Iowa, and I'm a lifelong Iowan, so I might be a little bit biased, but we have some of the best topsoil that you'll find anywhere on the planet. And what I wanna show is 
by having these living perennial roots that have, have roots in the ground year, year round, um, what, what you're doing to protect that soil and what you can really see um, when you get some of these roots. So we can, we'll do a little digging here. Oh, that comes up easy. Um, essentially, uh, you can see, um, you know, there's a quite a bit of root matter. Um, if you can zoom in on that, but you just have this thick black soil that has roots uh, growing through it that are supporting this plant and then keeping that soil in place. So this would be a Canada wild rye. You can see some nice, nice thick living roots here and it's still kind of early in the season, but something that's keeping the soil held in place. Okay, so uh, here we are in the middle of a bean field. Um, and again, we've got some of the best soil on the planet. Uh, I just want to show kind of by contrast um, how easily the shovel goes in out here. And then what we're looking at, um, you know, you can see some of last year's corn stover and, and stalks and things, but you know, it, all this soil, it's just, it's incredibly black, it's incredibly rich but there's just zero, zero living material here um, just between these bean rows. So this incredible soil that we have, um, it's, it's, just not, it's not being protected at all by any living roots. It's just, it's very, very vulnerable right now. Uh, the STRIPS team at Iowa State and beyond, it's an interdisciplinary research team. We're out here collecting just a, an extreme variety of data. There's uh, dozens of people that are working on various aspects of data collection. We're looking at uh, pesticides, microbes in the soil. We're looking at soil movement, water movement. We're looking at bird habitat. We're looking at honeybees. We're looking at native bees, looking at beetles and, and on and on and on. And one of the things that we have here in front of us is what's called a cover board. So um, here we have kind of artificial habitat that's really good for things like small mammals and snakes. Um, there's a, a dedicated team at Iowa State that comes out and they look at these cover boards. You can see here, we'll flip one. Well, there's nobody home today, um, but you can see that there's little animal tracks and little burrows. So somebody has been here not too long ago. So this is just another aspect of the research that's going on here at, at this Iowa State Farm. Well, this actually started at the Neil Smith National Wildlife Refuge uh, near Prairie City, which is just east of Des Moines. So I would encourage if you get a chance, um, it's open to the public and you can go and you can view those initial fields where the, the data was collected. As time has gone on, and the data collection became more and more robust and we realized, well, there's something going on here and these, these are creating a positive change within an ag landscape. Farmers and landowners around the state started to wonder, well, if they could, if they could put prairie strips on their land. And so now um, we're sitting at around 65 different farmers around the state of Iowa that have put prairie strips on their land. And this is from kind of all corners of the state uh, and we're starting to expand to surrounding states like Illinois, um, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Indiana, Michigan, Nebraska, Missouri. Um, and this, this idea is just kind of starting to spread out and go further and further. And as I mentioned, it's a, a part of a CRP practice now. So this would be a nationwide program where you could put prairie strips in fields. Um, but this is something that started to grow more and more. 